this is really a great honor uh, tonight to be able to introduce Dr. Helen Caldicott. Few people have been a more articulate and passionate voice for citizen action than Dr. Helen Caldicott. Uh, Helen has dealt with nuclear disarmament, uh, environmental degradation, nuclear energy, uh, lifestyle choices that we all make, and through all this, Helen has been one of those really prophetic voices and a visionary activist. She was born in Melbourne, Australia. She's a pediatrician by training. Uh, she founded the Cystic Fibrosis Clinic at Adelaide uh, Children's Hospital. And she subsequently moved to the United States uh, temporarily. She came to Boston in uh, 1978, uh, was an instructor in pediatrics at Harvard uh, and on the staff of Children's Hospital in Boston. But Dr. Hel Helen Caldicott realized early in her uh, training as a physician that her role extended well beyond the clinic and the hospital walls. In 1971, she played a major role in Australia's opposition to French atmospheric nuclear testing uh, in the Pacific. In 1975, she worked with the Australian uh, trade unions to educate their members about the medical uh, dangers of uranium mining. When she moved to Boston in 1978, uh, she called on other physicians to speak out against the medical consequences of nuclear war. Nuclear Holocaust would be the final epidemic. The only prescription was prevention. The name assumed by this group of activists was Physicians for Social Responsibility, a then dormant organization which had been active in the early 1960s in publicizing strontium-90 in the, in the teeth of young children uh, from atmospheric testing of nuclear weapons. Helen is one of the few people that I know that has actually had a personal meeting with a sitting president in the Oval Office. We'll never know the impact of our meeting with President Reagan, but not long thereafter, the president uh, began to say that nuclear war was unwinnable. And he and President Gorbachev started a series of meetings to reduce US and nuclear arsenals. Helen went on to found the Women's Action for Nuclear Disarmament, WAND, the Nuclear Policy Research Institute, which became Beyond Nuclear, and Star Foundation. She is the author of eight books, including Nuclear Madness, Missile Envy, War in Heaven, If You Love This Planet, A Plan to Heal the Earth, and I think there's a recent edition of that, uh, an autobiography called A Desperate Passion, Nuclear Power is Not the Answer, and The Medal of Dishonor, which talks about depleted uranium. Dr. Helicott has received many prizes and awards for her work, including the Lannan Foundation's 2003 Prize for Cultural Freedom and 21 honorary doctoral degrees. She was personally nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize by Linus Pauling, himself a two-time Nobel laureate. The Smithsonian Institute has named Dr. Caldicott as one of the most influential women of the 20th century. She has also been the subject of several films, including Eight Minutes to Midnight, nominated for an Academy Award in 1981, If You Love This Planet, which won the Academy Award for Best Documentary in 1982, and Helen's War, Portrait of a Dissident, which received the Australian Film Institute Award for Best Direction in 2004. Dr. Caldicott uh, currently lives in Australia, but she lectures widely around the world, uh, most recently in Germany. She can be heard discussing urgent uh, planetary survival issues on her weekly radio show, If You Love This Planet, which is on Pacifica Radio. So, having said all that, it really is a distinct honor and a great pleasure to introduce a dear old friend, Helen Caldicott. Well, I have to say, I've had a lot of mixed emotions tonight. Um, we had 153 chapters at the height of PSR. I knew Karen Steingart really well. I don't, what happened to Karen? Yeah. Um, and uh, I've known Andy forever. And I used to say that the chapters were my chickies. 
and I would go around and kind of service them and look after them all around the country. And so I feel very proud to be here and see the evolution of Portland PSR. Del Greenfield was a dear, dear, darling friend of mine. I love Del, what a lovely woman. And so, yeah, I've got a, I've, I've got a lot of feelings tonight. Uh, I've told a few people I never know what I'm going to say when I stand up, so this is just extemporaneous. Uh, well, I guess we have to come back to the hard reality. Where are we today? We're in a mess, and you all know that. And I can't help but see the world as a physician. Um, and I say that I'm not an activist. I practice planetary preventive medicine or planet, planetary preventive pediatrics, having taken the Hippocratic Oath. And as I look at where we are today, um, the planet's in the intensive care unit. And it's, well, is it terminally ill? I don't know. But in terms of the dynamics that are leading us towards the precipice, I see no evidence that anyone is taking any responsibility whatsoever, except some PSR chapters on some other really good people. But when I look at the politics in Washington, and in my country, I said at the Occupy Washington uh, rally yesterday in DC, and I mean this, that the Congress is full of corporate prostitutes. <laughs> that nearly... <laughs> that nearly every senator is a millionaire who does not represent the 99%. That Obama's spending a billion dollars this year to get re-elected. And where is that money coming from? It's coming from the corporations and the nuclear industry and the military industrial complex. So they're just puppets hanging by threads with their arms moving and their legs moving, but they do not represent the people. And we know that over a trillion dollars a year is spent on weapons and death and how to fight wars and training those lovely young boys who've just reached puberty to go to Iraq and Iran and Afghanistan. And I see them in the airports, these lovely young kids, and I look at them and I think, are you going to come home? Or will you come home with your arms and legs blown off but your Kevlar jacket protected your torso? Will you have, um, you know, post-traumatic stress syndrome, which more than 50% of them have or more? Will you go mad and go and shoot Afghan civilians and children? Heavy metal jacket, that's what it is, heavy metal jacket. I am very disturbed by the state of this country. I wonder why we have to keep killing. And I go back to Einstein, and it's really my bottom line. The splitting of the atom changed everything, all reality, save man's mode of thinking. Thus we drift towards unparalleled catastrophe, and that thinking has not changed one iota since the Manhattan Project. You know, when they went into the World Trade Towers, I was just flown into Madison, Wisconsin, or Eau Claire, Wisconsin, to give a speech. And I got up in the morning, I'd just come in from Australia and I watched those planes fly in and I thought, oh my God, what am I going to say to the students tonight? And as I walked across the campus, one woman approached me and she said, do you believe in Jesus? And I said, no, I'm a pantheist. And she almost, she psychologically slapped me on the face and said, you'll go to hell. And I thought, what sort of place is this? So I thought, um, I got out the Bible. And I read what Jesus said, love thine enemies and do good to those who hate you, which is, and so thousands of students poured in with their faces ash and white that night. And I based my speech around that, hoping to hell that this country wouldn't turn into a tribe and seek vengeance. I was supposed to fly to Paris to speak the next day, but there were no planes except they flew all the Bin Laden family out the next day. 
And they knew the name of all the people that flew into the World Trade Towers because they'd left their passports in the trunks of their cars. Don't tell me that they didn't know what was going on. So three days later, I've never given a speech like this before, <laughs> I took a Greyhound bus across America to where I had to go. And the country was wreathed in flags. And every mum and pop store said, God bless America. And I thought, oh my God. We're so primitive. We're like troglodytes. When we lived in caves, I suppose it was appropriate to pen men the, that the men went out and killed the sabre-toothed tigers and the marauding tribes while we breastfed our babies in the caves, but we haven't changed, not at all. Why do we keep killing each other? How can anyone kill anyone else when we spend our lives trying to save patients' lives, falling in love with our patients? How many children have I helped to die with cystic fibrosis? What does life really mean? How precious is it that our sperm reached our egg? What a privilege it is that we've all been born and conceived. And what responsibility does that mean that we have to saving possibly the only life in the universe? I was quite a close friend of Carl Sagan and I once said to him, Carl, do you think there's any other life in the universe? And he paused for a long time. And then he said, no. I said, why? He said, because if any species had reached the stage of development psychologically that we've reached, they would have destroyed themselves. Why do we glorify war? Why is there a killer on a horse in every square of Europe? Why do we talk about national defence when it's not about national defence? This country only needs a coast guard to protect itself because you've got friendly countries to the north and south, although the Pentagon is writing papers about what would happen if Canada turned malicious. <laughs> oh, yeah. Why do we have nuclear weapons? So I'm interested in writing a book called Why Men Kill and Why Women Let Them. I have to be honest though, and I can say this from a physiological perspective to you who are physicians and allied people, that when I was young, I couldn't help myself. I used to fall in love with alpha males. Why? Well, was it a socio-biological thing that when we were troglodytes, did we need to mate with alpha males to protect our babies as we breastfed them, as they went out and killed the saber-toothed tigers? Is it that? I don't know. I've got to read E.O. O. Wilson, and there's a lot of new work done about hormone receptors in the brain, and particularly oxytocin, which we women secrete in the time of stress, which is a wonderful hormone that creates, creates conflict resolution. But you see, what I'm interested in now is unless we can diagnose the etiology, we can't cure an illness. So when we got the polio virus isolated, we prevented polio, in our country anyway. India, they still get polio. So what's the etiology of killing? Why do we, why does everyone, since, since the oil crisis in the 80s, or 70s I think, the form of international commerce now is weapons. America, Russia, England, France, they sell weapons to friend and foe alike. So little boys of 14 or less are running around in Africa shooting old women and... <sighs> What's it about? Why, why do we kill? So I want to write a book trying to analyse the etiology of killing. For unless we can diagnose the pathology infecting our planet, and we are the macrobes, we're not going to make it. And then I, can, I think, I'm being really honest with you because I'm with my colleagues. Are we an evolutionary aberrant? We've only been around for a short time, about two million years or less. The problem is, you see, though, and, you know, the sun's going to blow up in 90 billion years. 
and the earth will disappear and how precious are we? Well, you know, species come and go. But the thing is that we cohabit the planet with 30 million other species who are as precious and as important as are we, the bees, which we're killing by putting insecticides in the corn now through genetic engineering and the like. So if we take ourselves out, we take most other species out. And that I can't contemplate. And I suppose because I, you know, I'm a paediatrician and so potentially all the world's children are my patients. That's how I see it, having taken the Hippocratic Oath. I can't rest until we do the right thing. So there are three main issues facing the planet now. There's global warming, and I wrote about this in 1991 in this book, If You Love This Planet, and stupidly, I always think if I write a book about it, everyone will read it and fix it. I'm very naive. Well, I've just been to this conference in Freiburg, Germany, with international Nobel laureates, and uh, the story is that by 2050, the Earth's going to be three degrees hotter, and by the year two the end of the century it's going to be six degrees hotter which is antithetical to life certainly our life we won't survive and so I look at these beautiful young children and I'm going to see my grandson Liam soon in Boston who I I, I love so much I could eat him <laughs> he's so gorgeous they're not going to survive and I see no evidence at all in this country that anything is fixing it all SUVs should be banned mandated People driving their little children to ballet in, ta in tanks, doing five miles of the gallon. People leaving their lights on all night. You know, using clothes dryers when people should be hanging their clothes out in the nuclear reactor in the sky when it shines and in the, you know, bring them in and hang them next to your furnace in the winter. Increases the humidity. I see the Congress organised by the corporations. The Occupy movement is fantastic and I think that's one hope. But then I look at America and most people don't vote. In Australia, voting is compulsory. We get fined $50 if we don't vote. Everyone votes. Down syndromes up to, you know, Mensa people. Everyone votes. We consider it a great privilege. So I say to people here, if you don't vote, you should go and live in Yemen. You have no right to live in a democracy unless you vote. should be compulsory. One. Two. Then when people vote, they don't know who their congresspeople are or their senators. And what people don't understand is in a democracy, those people are your representatives and you are their leaders. The president is not your leader. He is your representatives. representative. So if you don't get to know your representatives every time they come home and educate them, make them read this. Say, so if you don't read this, I'm going to door knock and make sure you don't get elected. Then they'll read it. Or this one, nuclear power is not the answer to global warming because most politicians are scientifically and medically absolutely illiterate. They're lawyers who know no biology. My brother's a lawyer. They grease the wheels of everything that happens, or they're businessmen, and they don't, uh, mostly men, don't understand biology, radiation biology. So people need to get to know who their senators are and their representatives and educate them. And if people don't do that, into the vacuum that is created and left, walk the corporations. So it's, so, it's sort of QED, isn't it? A plus B equals C. I mean, it's, it's obvious this is going to happen. Uh, okay, so we can fix global warming. How? Well, I commissioned a study two years ago by Arjun Makajani, a brilliant plasma physicist, and, I, and, and David Freeman, I don't know if you know who he was, but he was, he was uh, Carter's science advisor. He put the solar panels on the White House, he turned down the thermostat, Jimmy Carter wore a cardigan, which some people didn't like, they thought it was a bit infradig for Jimmy to go on television with a cardigan. And when Reagan got elected, he took off the solar panels and turned up the thermostat. But he's a brilliant guy, David Freeman. And I held a conference called Global Warming and Nuclear Power. And at the end of two days, very intense discussion with the leading scientists in the world, he stood up and said, we can have all the energy we need with no carbon and no nuclear. And I said, David, you're kidding. He said, no, we can. So I commissioned this study. 
And this is the prescription for survival. There is enough technology now which is really cheap to supply the whole country with renewable energy right now. I've just been in California. Why isn't every house covered with solar panels? I mean, I can't believe it. The sun's pouring down, pouring down. And imagine if they did that, the GDP would go up, millions of people would be, uh, be employed. Um, solar panels covering all the parking lots so that you get your electric car from China, you plug in your car, and you drive your car, electric car with solar power. Take it home, plug it into your house at night. There's enough wind west of the Mississippi to supply the whole country with three times the electricity America needs. You have to upgrade the grid. That's good, more jobs. Geothermal energy is available. Cogeneration and Americans waste 28% of the electricity they use. They waste it, leave all their lights on. The sense of entitlement is extraordinary. I'm in Europe, the corridor light turns on, in three minutes it automatically turns off. If you all stop using clothes dryers, you almost wouldn't need nuclear power. Well, GE makes good things for life, doesn't it? Clothes, I mean, irons, electric stoves, refrigerators, clothes dryers, nuclear power plants, because you've got to use the electricity they generate by having, you know, clothes dryers, nuclear weapons, nuclear missiles, and they're presently arming space. So I wrote a book about this with someone else called War in Heaven, and the corporations now are putting weapons in space, so America dominates, it's called the high frontier, uh, and they're going to fight war from space down to Earth, and it's happening as I speak. Well, they've got to steal your tax dollars somehow, don't they? So this is the prescription for survival. It's so exciting. Nuclear power provides 20% of your electricity and you waste 28%. QED. I read this when I was in the bath and I felt like Archimedes when he discovered his principle. Remember, he was in the bath and the volume of water displaced equals the volume of his body and he ran down naked down the street saying, I've just developed the Archimedes principle. And I felt like leaping out of the bath saying, this is the prescription for survival, which indeed it is. And it's being used by Texas, Utah, and other nations, I mean states. So, th <laughs> so this is your prescription for survival, and I want PSR to take this and really get it out there, because don't let anyone tell you that we have to have nuclear or coal or oil. We can stop the whole thing, like now. So that's one answer. And we can close that whoops reactor down in Hanford because you all own it and it's uh, publicly owned. So there are ways to do that. There are people here that will organise and help you do that. You've got to. There's a huge amount of spent fuel at that reactor, much more than at Fukushima. And I'll get into that in a second. So that's the answer to global warming. Nuclear power, well... Um, you all have to now study this book produced by the National Academy of Sciences, New York Academy of Sciences, called Chernobyl, where they took 5,000 papers written in Russian in peer group literature, epidemiologists, physicians and the like. Up to now, 25 years post Chernobyl, a million people or more have died. 40% of Europe is radioactive. The food will remain radioactive for hundreds of years as isotopes bioconcentrate in the food chain for the rest of time. We can't taste, smell or see them. Um, and the UN agencies are saying only 4,000 people died. The WHO has an alliance with the IAEA to say that they can't investigate any atomic accidents unless the atomic in International Atomic Energy Agency, which promotes nuclear power, allows the WHO to do that. So the WHO has never looked at Chernobyl, World Health Organization. I have never known such a cover-up in the history of medicine. This is worse than the Black Plague. It's the worse than smallpox, because that only killed those people. But nuclear accidents never end. They mutate genes to cause deleterious mutations like cystic fibrosis, diabetes, and we all carry several hundred of those genes. I carry the gene I've just found out for hemochromatosis. My son has just been diagnosed at 48 with hemochromatosis. And I've been saying this for years, and I now know I carry that gene. 
And as we fill the, the environment up with radioactive elements that mutate genes in our eggs and sperm, so we will produce down the time track random compulsory genetic engineering for the rest of time. Not just in humans, but animals and plants as well. And as radiation leaks from the nuclear power plants and the radioactive waste and Hanford, so the food will become contaminated and you can imagine year, year, years hence the legacy we leave as babies are being born deformed with teratogenesis like they are in Basra and Fallujah where they use DU weapons. Babies born with cyclops, phocomelia, and carefully, so much so in Fallujah that the obstetricians have told the women to stop having babies because there's such a prevalence of grossly deformed babies. So extrapolate that in the future with radioactive waste dumps leaking all over the place, the food radioactive, breast milk radioactive, babies being born deformed and getting cancers at the age of six instead of 70. So nuclear accidents are ongoing for the rest of time as genes get mutated, passed on generation to generation. The radioactive isotopes living on to get into testicle and ovary for the rest of time, producing more and more so you can see an exponential increase in genetic disease as well as malignancy for the rest of time. And that's what we bequeath our descendants. Because Einstein developed E equals MC squared and there's a fascination with these weapons and with nuclear power and the DOE calls nuclear power hard energy. And solar is soft energy, flaccid. That's what they say. And so their terminology is very revealing. Oh, Fuk Fukushima. When two days after it happened, I suddenly got this feeling, my God, this is going to never end and there's nothing we can do about it. You know when you know a patient's got acute myeloid leukemia and there's nothing we can do about it. We know they're going to die. And I suddenly realised that huge parts of the Northern Hemisphere would be contaminated and there's nothing we can do. Although people kept emailing me and saying, what do I feed my baby? Where do I go? What do I do? There's nothing we can do. Three meltdowns in the first 48 hours. The Japanese government didn't tell their people for three months. People moved to the most contaminated areas in Japan. The government didn't tell them they were contaminated. Children are living in areas now which were evacuated after Chernobyl because they were so radioactive. They've just tested fish in Itate, freshwater fish, and they have 18,700 uh, 18, becquerels, these fish. And the level that the Japanese government says is okay is below 500 becquerels. 18,700 in freshwater fish to the northwest of Fukushima. I, I've never read anything like this, ever. They've looked at over 3,000 children in Itate, which got a high fallout, quite a long way, I think 100k from Fukushima. One third of them have thyroid nodules. One third, now this is within a year, you don't expect solid cancers to appear for 15 years. Leukemia, five years, but solid cancers, 15 years. Although children are 10 to 20 times more radiosensitive than adults and little girls, double little boys, twice as much. And the Japanese government said they're going to follow the children. They haven't done fine needle biopsies, they haven't taken the nodules out, looked at the histology and the pathology. If they're thyroid cancers, they should be removed. The thyroid should be removed. This is what's going on in Japan. I kid you not, this is unbelievable in the history of medicine. Much worse than Chernobyl. The amount of radiation they tipped into the sea is almost uncountable. Terra becquerels. A terra becquerel, I think, for ma mathematicians here, what's, there's a very brilliant mathematician student here. Terra becquerel is a billion, no, a trillion billion or something, of amount of radiation. The radiation uh, in Seattle went up 40,000 times above ambient levels. You got a hell of a fallout. 
The people in Seattle got five hotspots per day in their lung, which may mean hotspots of plutonium and the like. The EPA has stopped measuring your air um, and uh, they're not measuring the fish, which are going to be swimming over towards you and the big fish as we bioconcentrate up the food chain, algae, crustaceans, little fish, big fish, us, and you can't taste it. You'll be catching fish that are probably radioactive. And you're not being looked after by the EPA or anyone else. And I heard that the word went out from the White House soon after Fukushima that uh, the State Department and the EPA are not to attend to this accident at all. Now, this is a medical issue. It's not political, it's medical. It's our responsibility, ours. And that's why I started PSO in the beginning. I started it about nuclear power because I was asked by Arnold Relman to write an article about the medical effects of nuclear power for the New England Journal. It was rejected in the long run because I didn't say anything good about it. And I said, well, this, in the peer reviews, I said, there's nothing medically good about nuclear power. So it was, and so I spent a year in the Harvard Library, Countway Library, researching nuclear power. And that's why I started PSO in the first place. I turned to Ira Helfand and I said, Ira, this is a medical issue. And that's how we started PSO. And then we got into weapons as well. So we can close down the reactors, but only if the doctors step out and get on television like we did in the 80s and educate people. Mr. and Mrs. Joe Sixpack do not understand mutation. They don't know what a regulatory gene is. They don't know that a single, al single alpha particle hitting a single gene in a single cell will kill you. They don't know the latent period of carcinogenesis. Like I debated with George Mombio from The Guardian just after the accident. He said, well, no one's died. No one's dropped dead. We don't expect anyone to be dead yet. And how do you educate journalists who are so scientifically illiterate? It's our responsibility. No one else's because we understand. And the best audience I ever addressed are doctors. I went back to Children's Hospital at Harvard recently. Mary Ellen Avery was there, who developed surfactant. And you know, the greats in pediatric medicine, they were so flabbergasted when I described the whole thing, they were speechless, because we understand. Last but not least, <sighs> yeah, we ended the Cold War. And really, PSR led that movement. And we educated 80% of Americans to understand that nuclear war was bad for their health. Because when I first came here, I, most people said, well, you know, it's better to be dead than red. 78, 1978, I said, you'd rather be killed in a nuclear war? They said, yeah, we don't want to be communists. I mean, there was sort of a mass psychosis. <laughs> I said, what about the pygmies in Africa? They'll be killed too. And they said, yeah, they need to be killed because they don't want to be communist. So we started doing the bombing run and describing the medical effects. And in five years, 80% of Americans opposed nuclear war. That was the second American revolution, a la Jefferson. Some people are yawning, so I'm boring you. Don't yawn. <laughs> what have I got to do, do a strip? <laughs> I know it's boring, but you've got to listen because it's the future of the planet. Too, am I too emotional? It's inappropriate to be unemotional about this. And if we're unemotional, we need psychiatric help. <laughs> so we helped to bring the Cold War to an end, us. Then we got Clinton, who had no backbone. As one of our politicians would call, call him Mr. Jelly, Mr. Jellyback or something. Anyway, he'd smoked some dope, he didn't inhale, he didn't go to Vietnam, he had no guts to take on the Pentagon. And here we were saying, we want you to abolish nuclear weapons. And we had Yeltsin over in the, in the, in the Kremlin, who was a hardened alcoholic, totally compliant. Clinton could have got in Air Force One, flown to the Kremlin and said, OK, Boris, sign this. In five years, we're going to abolish nuclear weapons, which Reagan and Gorbachev almost did at Reykjavik. But he didn't. So if we're blown up tonight because the weapons are still on hair trigger alert, thousands of them in Russia and America, of the, of the 23,000 H-bombs in the world, Russia and America are 97%. So who are the terrorists? New York is targeted with 40 H-bombs. 
McNamara and I wrote an article about that before he died. New, as Washington's targeted with 60 H-bombs. Every town and city with a population of 50,000 or more is targeted like that now. Since the Cold War ended, America's targeted China in its wisdom. The whole of Europe's targeted. Russia, everything. And it only takes a thousand bombs on a hundred cities to create such a pall of black radioactive smoke that blocks out the sun for 10 years and causes a short ice age and we all freeze to death in the dark. Now how likely is it that these weapons will be launched? They're ready to go with the press of the button. Obama gets three minutes to decide and so does Putin. And Yeltsin almost pressed the button. He got to within 10 seconds in 95 to pressing the button, 10 seconds. And they take 30 minutes to go from woe to go and vice versa. Do you know that there are a thousand people hacking into the Pentagon computers per day? The Chinese, into the early, early warning system as well. And this is my nightmare, because I've just spoken to a very brilliant computer person. I said, why hasn't ha it happened yet? And he said, because no one's, it hasn't happened because they haven't worked it out yet. But you can imagine a brilliant 16 year old boy, and I've got a grandson who's 16, who's just hit puberty. No frontal lobe development at all. You know, they sort of slope through the house, so how are you, God, you know, and you never know what they're going to do next totally unaccountable, but they're brilliant left brains. And you can imagine a 16-year-old kid, you can, anywhere in the world, hacking into the early warning system and for fun blowing up the world. I don't know why it hasn't happened yet. And these goddamn weapons, sorry, but this is how I feel, are still on hair trigger alert and they won't remove them. I got enough money to get Senator, I mean General Cartwright, who was the chief of, one chief of staff, um, plus other Americans and the Russians at Pekantigo in the Rockefeller estate to have a weekend together with no press to talk about why they're, th why they're deciding to blow up the world if necessary. For no reason, because the Russians are now friends. What is the pathology in these men's brains? Why do they want to do it? Why did I call my book Missile Envy, a la Freud? It goes back to that, and if you look at the language that the Pentagon uses, missile erectors, soft laydowns, deep penetration, hard lines and soft, I mean, it's all sexual, all sexual. You know, when a man designs a bomb from Los Alamos, he sleeps with the bomb in the desert the night before it's exploded. He talks about having labour pains, I kid you not, this work's been done by Hugh Gustafson, an anthropologist, having labour pains and the need to push. And when the bomb explodes, he talks about postnatal depression. This is etiology. And also you need to know that one in 25 people are sociopaths who are brilliant, charming, erudite people with no moral conscience, and you've all known people like that, you know, one such is Rumsfeld and one is Cheney, who's just got a new heart. <laughs> and these are the people that rise to the top like cream at Harvard, in corporations, and because they're quite, you know, they're driven, whereas ordinary people who are quite sane aren't driven, and they're the ones who run the world. So what are we going to do? Oh, well, we're, what about North Korea? Ooh, what about Iran? Ooh. It's only America and Russia that can blow up the planet. And then there's Israel, the third largest nuclear arsenal in the world, and she will neither confirm nor deny she has nuclear weapons. How dare she? And she hasn't signed the non-proliferation treaty. How dare she? And she's worried about Iran, and your 16 intelligence agencies say there's no evidence that Iran is building nuclear weapons, or has any. None. So let's end with a PSR study done a few years ago where they dropped three nuclear weapons on the two uranium enrichment facilities in Isfahan and Natanz, and I've been to both places. Um, because you can't do it with a bunker buster because these facilities are buried so deep. So you drop three weapons on each of them. The resulting fallout from the uranium, huge amounts, and the nuclear weapons would kill in the first 48 hours 
million people, all the way over to Afghanistan, the poorest country on earth, India and Pakistan. Does anyone ever talk about people dying when they talk about whether or not Iran should be bombed? And why, and you, you know, this is our area again, people dying. This is obscene. So it mustn't happen once again, this is our responsibility. Now you live here in the northwest, just up at Seattle is Puget Sound. In Puget Sound, rest um, up to 14 Trident submarines when they're not at sea. Each submarine, and I, I, you know, I can talk about the Minutemen silos and all the rest, I won't do that, but I suffice it to say that we are hanging by the sword of Damocles, as, te as Jack Kennedy once said. I honestly don't know how we're still here. I gathered all the data about near misses when I wrote my book, The New Nuclear Danger. You know when you get all the data from a patient and you work out what their prognosis is? I don't know how we're still here. And it's amazing to me that everyone's practicing manic denial. You know, oh, gourmet foods? Are we too fat? Are we too thin? Or beautiful fashions? When the elephant in the sitting room is sitting there and we could be annihilated tonight. And I'm not exaggerating. I'm not exaggerating. It's the truth. And this is how we started PSR off. And we got on television and we educated people to say, your life is in danger. And the American people who are good people rose up because they're really, really good people. And we can abolish nuclear weapons. We can fix global warming. We can close down the reactors. We can't do anything with the waste. And we can abolish nuclear weapons because Reagan and Gorbachev almost did at Reykjavik. What a magical thing, two mere mortals, two mere men. And there's a funny story about that, but I won't go into it now. Now, I want to show you a Trident submarine. You've got 40 Trident subs, just to give you an idea. I got some people <laughs> to do my Trident subs, and they've actually made the bombs look a bit funny, but anyway, they should be black, but they've made them look a bit... It's not my fault. <laughs> I'm still going to show you a Trident sub. On one Trident sub, up at Puget Sound, or circling the ocean silently at any one time, ready to send off their missiles, and one commander could, without negotiating with the Pentagon, send his missiles off by himself with his 2IC. So, okay, one Trident has 24 missiles, and each missile has eight hydrogen bombs, three each three times bigger than the Hiroshima bomb. So I'm going to show you a trident, and I want one, two, three, four, five, six, seven volunteers, and you, eight, up here now. <laughs> That's what the military says, I want three volunteers, you, you, and you. And I want you to hold up this trident submarine, and I want you all to look at it, and realise that just one of these bombs would vaporise New York practically. Well, you've got to hold it really high. They look a bit phallic. I didn't mean to do that. I didn't do it. They did. They should be painted black. But can you see all those red tips? They are all the hydrogen bombs. Can you, can you just get that visualised? This is nuclear madness. And you've got 14 of them. And Romney, he wants to build 15 more because he's big into ships. <laughs> so we've got a collective psychosis aboard and nuclear psychosis. And we are the only ones that can fix it. That's our responsibility as physicians. Okay? So we can fix that. So the pre prescription for survival is out there, but we've got to do it. Thank you very much.
Thank you. Sorry, it was a bit of a heavy talk, but you know, it's where I live. So, look, what about some questions? I've got one about just to mention the word masculine and feminine. Men have screwed it up. Well, have you got some ideas being a man? <laughs> I mean, it is men that fight and kill mostly. Right. Yeah. Why? I have looked at this actually in some depth. Uh, it's actually some interesting work being done on the, the reptilian midbrain. And in men, the two instincts that are very closely associated together are sex and violence. And sex releases dopamine, which is that lovely feeling you have after orgasm or is a morphine-like feeling, and so does violence. So what's the relationship between sex and violence? Why do they play porno films for men who take off from aircraft carriers to kill people and bomb them? Why do they do that? Why do men rape women when they uh, conquer a territory? I've, I've never, ever understood that. Um, and there's lots more relationship. You know, when men go into the military, they cut all their hair off which is kind of a feminine part. They accuse men who are not strong of being sissies and feminine or gay or all of that. What is the dynamic? I don't understand it and why do they do it? I don't know. But it's, I want to explore this in some depth. And it's much, much more profound than that too. See heavy metal jacket. Yeah. Right here. Yeah. Dr. Caldecott, I am um, very concerned about the information that is being disseminated on the Fukushima accident. I've been an anti-nuclear activist for 35 years and it seems as if all of a sudden the radioactive isotopes that could be released from a reactor are not even being discussed. We see cesium, we see iodine, we see nothing else, nothing. And I know the Japanese are forming um, citizen monitoring units, and I'm wondering why PSR does not take this on for the United States of America, because most people here are very confused and don't know what's happening to them, and why is this information not being talked about anymore? What happened to strontium? What happened to plutonium? Well, there are about 100, 100 isotopes, 100 isotopes. Tellurium, radioactive silver, radioactive barium, many of which actually have not been studied from a biological perspective to show where they go in the food chain um, and in, in human bodies. For instance, cesium is a potassium analogue and our cells are rich in potassium. Well, wait a minute. And cesium induces brain tumours, rhabdomyosarcomas. It tends to induce testicular and ovarian cancer but also mutates... The, the, the genes in the germ cells. Strontium-90, of course it's falling out. M migrates, it's a calcium analogue, half-life 30 years, 28 years, lasts for 600 years, goes to bone where it uses osteogenic sarcoma uh, and all sorts of uh, malignancies in the bone marrow. Why is it not being mentioned? Well, I don't know, I live in Australia. Yeah, I understand. <laughs> yeah, but uh, are, you, are you a member of PSR? I'm a member of PSR. Well, why? Well, I'm asking you, why isn't PSR into it? Well, I'm actually I'm asking you. You you founded PSR. Yeah, but I live I'm in Australia. I'm wondering why PSR. I and I am I'm newly a member of PSR, oh. though I've been involved with PSR over the years. Okay, now this. But is... I think that I really think that PSR is the lead organization it is. for forming the citizen monitoring that we need. No, no, citizen monitoring is no good because Geiger counters only pick up gamma. They do not pick up internal emitters, they do not measure beta, which is radioactive iodine, it's a gamma and a beta, but when you pass a Geiger counter over a kid's thyroid, it doesn't really assess how much radioactive iodine is. You need uh, people in whole body counters to monitor the spectrum of, of emissions from various isotopes and work out what's in their bodies. The food must be measured by the EPA consistently, the fish, the air, and the accident isn't over. If there's another earthquake, which there well could be, building four is going to collapse, 
and there's a very dangerous spent fuel pool there. If that happens, Tokyo will probably have to be evacuated and you're going to be in serious strife. There's so much hydrogen building up in the three buildings right now that there still could be a, another hydrogen explosion when Tokyo would have to be evacuated. So they're injecting nitrogen gas to dilute the hydrogen all the time, so the hydrogen won't. I mean, the, I can't tell you how serious this is. This accident hasn't finished. It's ongoing. So what you've got to do is get out there and educate the people, and, and you probably should have a committee to work out what exactly you're going to do, but Geiger counters won't do it. And you, it's not up to citizens. It's up to your government to do it. And there's a huge cover-up in the media, a huge cover-up. You're right. Uh, Dr. Caldercott, my name is Peter Spencer. I head up the Global Health Center at OHSU. And the gentleman who introduced you uh, was a guest at my class um, on global health in changing environments. <clears throat> and I asked him to throw a tennis ball at me while I was lecturing to the students. And I picked up a frisbee to defend myself. Whereupon Dr. Harris picked up a larger ball and hurled it at me whereupon I picked up a dustbin lid and protected myself. And the issue was for the students to debate was whether the aggressor, Dr. Harris, was the individual who was driving the armaments industry, in my case, the dustbin lid, or whether it was myself who was justifiably defending myself. So who is actually driving the arms race? Is it the aggressor or the defender? Are you talking now about Russia and America? I'm really asking you a philosophical question because obviously it is in human nature to defend oneself against someone throwing a rock. But yeah. the issue is that we... That I we, think that's we, more a male trait. My, my, my point is that we, we feel justified, obviously, in developing a more effective way of defending ourselves. But nuclear weapons don't defend you. No, I'm not suggesting They're they do. They're mutually suicidal. But we, but we will develop, we will develop an anti-missile missile system in order to prevent them coming. This is the pathology I need to investigate in my book, Why Men Kill and Why Women Let Them. I, I, I can't answer you, but I'm going to do the very best I can to work it out. I have to read a lot of Jung, Man and His Symbols, which I find absolutely fascinating. There's a lot of new work done on hormone receptors in the brain and and the influence on human behaviour. I want to get into religions, how many people have been killed in the name of God in the last century? Millions, millions. Um, you know, what's wrong with it? All, all religions are patriarchal, even the Buddhist religion, because I used to go to Buddhist retreats and I found it was... So there's a huge amount to investigate, and I, as I'm, not, I'm not a philosopher, but I promise you I'll do the very best I can once I sit down to write this book to investigate all of this. I don't know, but you've got a few good ideas yourself. Why ask me? Why don't you work it out? So may I give you another one? Yeah. <laughs> Throw me another one. So the students were told that they have the opportunity to sit on an Institute of Medicine panel which is designed to make sure that our armed forces go into battle with the best possible equipment to protect them and to make them the most efficient fighting machine. Killers, killers. So the issue that I put before the students was whether or not they would burnish their CV and have a small honorarium and travel to Washington and sit on this prestigious committee or whether or not uh, they were actually for, uh, whether or not they were actually increasing the opportunity for uh, major successful conflict, if you like. Because they were making sure that our armed forces were the healthiest possible, the most effective in battle. And remarkably, the vote from the students was that in fact they would prefer not to sit on that Institute of Medicine panel. That's interesting, you must have been a good teacher. Yeah, I think you've probably educated your students very well um, and there's pro probably an innate uh, morality too in your students. 
which everyone has. You see, I see a lot of, well, as doctors, we see a lot of stuff. And um, I've met a lot of men who are making weapons. I remember one man who was making cruise missiles. And I said to him, well, what about your children? He had young children. He looked at me with sort of dead eyes and he said, I'm making money. I said, yeah, but what about your, your children? They, they're not going to survive. And he did it again. Now, having treated many children who are dying, their fathers fall into my arms weeping. Or men who've lived really wicked lives like the cruise missile maker, on their deathbed, very often their soul opens up and they start telling me all the terrible things they've done because fundamentally every person knows the truth. Every person knows what they're doing. And they're born with that purity and knowledge and they die with it. But in the interim, many people cover it up and practice psychic numbing because they've got to earn money and all sorts of other things, dynamics that come into it. But fundamentally, everyone really knows. And I guess that's what you're, you were tapping into with your students. I don't know, but I would assume that. And that's what we all know as physicians. Uh, I, I think you're... Um, Please oh, I'm Greg Kafuri. Uh, Are you a physician? No, I'm a lawyer. Right. <laughs> I think. Good the um, sexual metaphor regarding shaving the heads of soldiers, I think, misses the point. Um, they shaved the heads of the uh, um, people in the concentration camps in Germany. It's, it's a dehumanization yeah. technique. Yeah. And uh, it's like putting you know, bags over the heads of. Uh, the POWs yep. in Afghanistan and, and, uh, and in uh, Iraq. Um, and if you look back to the uh, 1960s when the boys who were resisting grew their hair long. Uh, and the Beatles. Yeah, well, it, 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 it drew a violent reaction yeah. from a lot of people. It, it was expressive, it was sensual, and, uh, and uh, uh, that was inherently anti-authoritarian. Uh, they shave the, the heads off the soldiers, and they keep the soldiers very young, by and large, so that they're too dumb and, and too dehumanized to have the, the sense of organizing against what they're being asked to do. Uh, and, and the second thing is, uh, while I'm sure it's helpful to look at um, the psychology of uh, male aggression when you look at war, uh, we're moving beyond that in the United States, and now we have, you know, some geek sitting in, in, in Nevada who's watching a TV screen and taking out uh, wedding parties and rescue parties yep. and so on in, in, uh, in Pakistan. Yep. We're moving to, uh, to a whole different level. Dehumanized. And, and, and uh, uh, you might be a little bit behind the, uh, the curve in, uh, in looking at mano a mano warfare. Just a couple of thoughts. At what? Mano a mano What's warfare. That? Man to man. Oh. No, well, yeah, you know, it's just hy hygienic killing. Um, and, and always they talk about, you know, the American, how well the American soldiers will do and they won't get killed. But America's killed a million people in Iraq, half of whom are children. Half of whom are, and that's never talked about. It's as if other people don't matter. I mean, it's quite extraordinary to me as a physician that this is what, what people overtly talk about. I can't, I can't understand it. Yeah. I'm uh, Miriam German from Occupy Portland, and we're working on the A15 rally. Thank you so much. Um, we hope to see all of you there on A15. But um, Helen and I have been talking today, uh, earlier today, and Helen, I just wanted to continue this for a minute because I'm still, I'm challenged. And my challenge is this. We were talking about the fact that Hanford really can't ever get cleaned up, no matter what we do to it. It will never be cleaned up. And this is a philosoph philosophical um, conundrum for me because while we have to continue to try, to at least get it cleaned up to some level. And even as I say this, it sounds, um, 
it, just wrong. There's just something yeah. very wrong about it. Mm -hmm. So Helen, can you just address that for me? Because yeah. I'm really looking to you for a response about this, about how we need to deal with this yeah. emotionally or... Well, Hanford's kind of like Fukushima and Japan, which will never be the same again, ever, ever. Uh, they can't clean it up. Well, what does clean up mean? You just dig up the radioactive stuff and take it somewhere else and bury it. They can't get to those plumes of highly radioactive material heading towards and entering the Columbia River as we speak. The Columbia River has been the most radioactive river in the world. Uh, there were two men from uh, Hanford that worked there, went for a vacation at the mouth of the Columbia River, ate some oysters that were caught there, went back to their job, walked through the radiation monitors, and the radiation monitors went right off the scale because the oysters suck up the radioactive isotopes using bioconcentration. Um, I walked by the Columbia River today and I thought, I can't, I can't believe they've done this to the Columbia River. And there's a huge amount of radioactive waste there and they're trying to vitrify it, mix it with glass. Now when you put alpha emitters like plutonium and americium and curium and einsteinium in glass, the alpha particles defitrify the glass and destroy the glass because glass is basically physically a liquid. And so the glass just breaks and out the stuff leaks. So it's an exercise in futility and Bechtel is doing it and Bechtel set up a whole lot of stuff, terrible radioactive stuff in the past. The, the, the thing that concerns me so much about Hanford is many of those tanks, they put all sorts of stuff in those tanks, a whole lot of chemicals and radioactive stuff, they don't even know what's in them. But some can explode. And they were sitting right on the edge of having an absolute catastrophe, because if one of those tanks explodes and the wind's blowing towards you, I don't know how much is in the tanks, but there's a hell of a lot of radiation in each of those 177 tanks. You're, so, so you, I think number one is you've got, to, or they, or the scientists have to work out how the hell they stop those tanks exploding. And to be quite frank, as a, um, I did chemistry and stuff, I don't know if they can. I don't know if they know how. They don't even know what's in the tanks and they can't get near them because they're so radioactive. They can't vitrify it or that won't work anyway, so it's just a waste of your tax dollars. Um, uh, they'll never clean it up. I think it's something that has, has to be evacuated. And if the Tri-Cities are radioactive, they need to be evacuated first. But get the data first. What's in the food? What's the cancer incidence in the Tri-Cities? And have the data to know whether they should be evacuated or not. Um, I just wanted to ask you first off um, what the titles of the books you recommended, and then secondly, um, what you would recommend for the best way of learning about this? Well, I always go back to President Jefferson, who said a very profound thing, an educated democracy will behave in a responsible fashion. And as I had to learn Gray's Anatomy to become a physician, you need now to read the books. Well, you need to read the Chernobyl book, download it from the New York Academy of Sciences imperative reading for every physician in this room, the scariest book I've ever read in medicine. You need to read If You Love This Planet, how and why everyone's propagandised in this country, um, who, who runs the propaganda, how they develop propaganda, Rupert Murdoch, the whole thing, and global warming and, and all the catastrophes facing the planet. This is war in heaven. You really should get your head around that. <laughs> Nuclear power is not the answer. We'll teach you about nuclear power in Fukushima and all the rest, and you'll understand it in depth. And uh, you need to read um, Carbon Free, Nuclear Free. If you read all of those, you can debate anyone, including Obama. You can certainly debate Rush Limbaugh, which I would love to debate. And I, I've got one other suggestion. I think that you should get, as a, for PSR, uh, my film, If You Love This Planet, which won an Oscar for the best documentary, and the US Justice Department has banned it as foreign propaganda. It's just a medical talk. Could be Jack Geiger speaking, you know, it's, a, it's our talk. And it's banned as foreign propaganda, so I'm taking it around the country and saying that to the Justice Department. And if they want to come and arrest me, well then if they arrest me and I go to jail, I'll get on Rush Limbaugh.
and I'll get on Fox, you know? And that's what we've got to do. We've got to be provocative and we've got to get on the media because without the media, we'll never get anywhere. The media is a message. The media is determining the fate of the earth. And it's the only way to educate 280 million people through the media. So um, you have to think of ways to do that. And I think that's all. Thank you very much. Yeah. Oh, yeah. OK, one other thing. One other thing. This is a very precious PSR chapter. There are not many now in the country. This is precious. They need money. This is a very... Uh, she's the best executive director of any PSR chapter I've ever seen. She's fantastic. And this one's brilliant. And she's not really retired because she's going to take on PSR. Maybe you can take it on nationally. Because you've got that. She's a stem winder, this one. And she's a dermatologist. She's fantastic. So you, what we need, and Kelly needs tonight, is you've all got to get out your checkbooks. And I don't care if you've already given money. You write a check for PSR because this chapter could lead this country towards sanity and survival if you get your act together. We need money. We need the doctors to get going. And, and uh, don't say you haven't got time. Thank you so much.